the Absalike tribe. Uh, she graduated from the University of Montana in 2020 with a BFA in printmaking, a BA in psychology, and a minor in art history and criticism. She now lives and works in Missoula, Montana, lucky us, and is represented by Radius Gallery. Uh, her work lives in murals across Montana and in numerous public and private spaces. Um, you'll get to hear uh, uh, quite a bit about that today. And um, she is, uh, you, you can find her work in the Montana Museum of Art and Culture, Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian, and the Institute of American Indian Arts of Contemporary Native Arts. Um, without further ado, I will take it over to Stella. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to talk to you today about public art and particularly participation based public art. So um, starting off, I think uh, That's so thank you. when we're thinking about public art, I know that the first thing that often comes to my mind is thinking of outdoor murals or sculptures or other forms of permanent or semi permanent installations. But public art can come in so many different forms and use any artistic mediums, um, including performance art, and it can be either permanent or temporary. Um, and over the past few years, I've become increasingly interested in participatory public art. And I'm defining that as any sort of public art which, in which the community is invited to play an active role in the creation of the work rather than just being appreciative viewers at the end product of the art. Um, so most of the talk today I'm going to talk about um, some of the different forms that I've tried to develop projects that invite the public to participate in them. Um, and those are all things that I've implemented here in Missoula. But before getting into that, I wanted to just briefly touch on public art in general and um, some of the reasons I think it's important. So, and also just because I was really excited, I haven't really put all the murals I've done in one place until making this presentation. So I, um, these are all ones that I did in the past few years all over Montana. And then, um, it's not letting me click. Okay, here I go, sorry. And then these are some in Missoula. Um, and I think that public art can be a really important tool for community building because it can help beautify public spaces, but also it can express a sense of a place's history, culture, and identity. And I think that can be really important because when community members see themselves reflected in social spaces, I think it can help kind of create a sense of inclusion um, and art in public spaces, I think, is a really wonderful thing to have because it's accessible for everyone. Um, just people walking by can encounter it or you can purposely go and seek it out. Um, but I really love how accessible it is. And that's something that I think is really important. Um, but today, um, I guess I mostly wanted to talk about the projects that I've done that have directly involved um, inviting community members to participate in them. And I started doing these sorts of projects around 2018. And the first one that I ever did is called Hobgoblin Blue. And I was going kind of back and forth about whether or not it would be kind of interesting or important to share in this conversation. But I thought it was maybe a good starting place because it was the first time I had ever invited other people into the process of creating art for an installation. Um, and I think I would do a lot of things differently now if I redid it, but I learned a lot from it. Um, and it was basically, I had um, signed up for an art slot to have an exhi ex exhibition at um, a coffee shop in town here, the Dog and Bicycle. Um, and they said I could do whatever I wanted. And so I hadn't really had that many art shows before at the time. So I invited my friend, Brendan Tobolsky, who's a photographer, to help um, kind of come up with a body of work. And he said, oh yes, you do everything that you wanna do and I'll have my photos and we can mush it together at the end. So this is the artist statement that we ended up coming up with, which uh, is pretty, kind of covers it. Um, so the exhibition is about the color blue and about friendship. So um, all of the photos that my friend contributed had some component of the color blue in them. And because I was a 
kind of inexperienced artist at this point. Um, I didn't really document his work, which I feel ashamed of, but he, um, I can maybe link to his website or his Instagram after this. Um, but the component that I wanted to do for this um, exhibition was to try to invite people to have some sort of active role in the work that I was producing. So at the time I was taking a screen printing class and I was really excited about uh, learning the processes of printmaking. And um, I was trying to think about how someone could start to become involved in the process without knowing how to do printmaking. And one of the things that I thought was a good introductory point to like art in general is a blind contour drawing. So it's where you look at a subject or a person um, or it could be anything and you draw it without looking um, down at the page. So it ends up being kind of this squiggly thing. And that's where the title Hobgoblin came from because um, I was going to do portraits of whoever wanted to participate and they ended up kind of looking like hobgoblins. But um, I guess the main idea I had for this project was to invite as many people as I could, whoever wanted to participate to have their portrait drawn in a blind contour um, style and then they told me that um, whoever participated sent me their favorite color so I ended up drawing blind, blind contour portraits of um, everyone who replied to the participation call and then creating this body of prints where it incorporated their favorite colors so these are just some examples of the different prints that um, ended up happening from this kind of experiment installation um, and I think it ended up being really interesting to see um, all of it together at the end because it showed like, yeah, I guess how many people had participated and um, this particular installation ended up being mostly people that I knew ahead of time because I put the call for participation mostly around the School of Art. Um, but I learned a lot going from this project and I think it was kind of a catalyst into feeling like I really wanted to create projects that could have even more participation involved in them. Um, and at the exhibition for this piece, I had like last minute brought some little pieces of paper and pens so that viewers could come and draw their own blind contour portraits while they were there. And that ended up being like a really exciting component of the installation that I thought I wanted to create something that was more intentional and in its invitation for people to have uh, participation in it. So that kind of led me to this next project that I want to share about, which is called Love Is. Um, it's one of the projects that I think I was, I've maybe like one of the more passionate projects that I've ever done. Um, it took place over about a year and I started out with this idea that I, was talking with some of my friends and I realized that not everyone has the same idea about what love is, but I know it's very important to many people. Um, so I was thinking about the questions, um, what do you think that love is? Is it different to love someone versus to be in love with them? And then is there anything else that you want to say about love? So I reached out to people over the course of 2019 to 2020 and I started by writing letters just with these questions in them and sending them to um, anyone that I had direct contact with, like mostly friends and family. And then I was really loving the responses that I got from them. So I started wanting to invite um, community members that I didn't know to participate as well. So I made um, these printed out posters with these questions on them and then my email and hung them all over town. And then people started generating responses and responding to me. Um, so then I compiled all of them into um, a long list of all of the answers to the questions. And there was um, kind of an overwhelming response. I didn't really know what was going to happen at first, but I ended up with about 100 participants. Um, and people wrote really touching stories about their own experiences with both like romantic and familial love and what they thought love meant to them. Um, and I wasn't going into this project. I was kind of really interested in just like researching and learning about other people's perspectives, but I wasn't entirely sure what I wanted to do at the end of the year um, as a kind of cumulative installation for this project. But um, I ended up researching 
like venues that maybe I could put together an exhibit of the work that was kind of produced alongside reading the responses that people sent to me. And there was a gallery that used to be open um, just on first Fridays called Frontier Space. And I got this idea to fill the gallery with all of the responses that people had sent and got really excited about that. So I applied and was able to have a slot for February first Friday. So I ended up um, with the permission of everyone who had sent me these letters, I covered the gallery walls with everyone's responses. And um, I drew illustrations for as many of them as I could, um, which they ended up being kind of like quick pen and ink illustrations mostly, but I ended up trying to find frames for all of them and stuck them in the gallery too. Um, so this is what it the space looked like really kind of I guess you wouldn't even know it was there if you didn't, but I um, was really excited about it. It's like just in this gallery, in this cubby wall. So I tried to take photos of um, the installation, but this is how I set it up before everyone was invited to come. And then on the opening, I had um, all of these papers in the middle of it here so that people who had not known about the installation in advance could come and write their thoughts and then pin so they could stick them on the wall, which um, I really wish I took photos of it after. And now that I have had a little bit more experience with doing installation art, I definitely would remember to do that. But um, it ended up being a really powerful experience where I had worked for this whole year on gathering people's thoughts. And then it was really powerful to see how many people came to the opening and had contributed their own thoughts and just seeing people read everyone's um, different experiences with love was really impactful to me. Um, and also just spending a year on the project and then having it open just for one night was a really interesting experience for me. Um, and so this next project that I wanted to, it was kind of inspired by um, the process of um, having these papers in the middle of this installation and inviting people to participate um, through writing and um, sticking it on the wall. Um, so while I was a student at the University of Montana, they have a student gallery, um, which is rotating through exhibitions of current students at the time. And they had a cancellation that was kind of last minute. Um, so they, I saw that there was an opening like a week um, and like um, a week from when I saw the post about it. So I applied and I had been working on this um, book of poems and these big abstract paintings for kind of just my own processing while I was working on other studio projects. And I'd never really showed them as a complete body of work before, but I decided to like put them all in the gallery um, and for this exhibition. So this is kind of some photos of me painting them so you can see the scale a little bit better. Um, but they are these really big abstract paintings. And then um, I printed all the poems out onto these little zines um, and started putting everything in the gallery so that it was the abstract paintings alongside the poems. Um, and I knew that I wanted it to be something that people could interact with in a similar way to the Love Is project. Um, so I ended up bringing um, my own desk into the into the gallery and leaving my typewriter inside there um, with a bunch of blank paper and allowing people to write their own poems and stick them around the gallery as well. Um, and these are uh, this was kind of an experimental installation because it was so last minute. So I ended up trying to do some kind of sculptures as well, and I tried to take photos of those to show them, but. I don't know what I really thought of those, but it ended up being interesting to try to put it all together. And um, in addition to having the places where people could write their own poems, um, I printed out a bunch of these little poem books of my writing and had a sign up that just that they were just free to take and whoever wanted to read them could bring them home and um, keep them or give them away. Um, and I had these little prompts around the gallery, like this one is, what do you feel, which is kind of, I don't know, dramatic and vague at the same time. So I, I forget what the other ones were that I put around the gallery, but it was really interesting seeing people's responses to them. Um, and those were kind of like, I guess, 
not super organized projects for inviting the public, but they really were the catalyst for the rest of my projects that were a lot more thought out and um, invited a more significant amount of participation from the public. So I kind of included them in this part uh, in this presentation just to kind of show some background as to what got me started and interested in working with the public. Um, so the project that I think really began kind of like um, my interest in public participation, public art was this project called Feeling Welcome that was put on by the Zootown Community Arts Center. Um, they called it the Alley Project, um, Feeling Welcome. And I just saw this call for art um, where they had a grant for four muralists to create work behind them in the in the alley there. Um, and the intention behind it was to amplify the perspectives of community members. And it was really open-ended aside from that. Um, they just wanted you to somehow create a project that invited the uh, perspectives of the community to be elevated. Um, so I was thinking that was kind of my starting point for it. And I knew I wanted to paint a mural and um, have the community be involved in the process of generating the art. So I started thinking about and sketching ideas for what I wanted to do. And I came up with um, this art call, which this is just a photo of the poster that I hung around town. Um, and it basically says, like, hello, Missoula, I'm painting a mural, uh, want to lend a hand. And I invited people to send me a photo of their hands and a sentence or two about themselves um, and their favorite color. Um, knowing that I would incorporate the submissions into a mural um, and hopefully it would give opportunity for people to connect with one another, um, which another big catalyst for this project was that it was during the COVID shutdown. So I was trying to think about ways that people could connect with one another through, while also maintaining social distancing. So um, this, I this ended up being like a really involved project where I wasn't quite sure how many people would respond going into it, but this was a photo of my my computer where I ended up having 70 participants and they all sent me photos of their hand and information about their identities or their experiences and um, their favorite colors. So I compiled all those into these folders. And then this is kind of what some of the submissions looked like. Um, basically lots of people just sending photos of their hands. Um, and then I illustrated all of them and put them into a book um, online. And um, then I took the illustrations and used them as references to create this mural. Um, so each of the hands on the, on the mural ended up being um, one of the people who had submitted to the art call. And I made it so that you could go online at the, after the mural was completed on my website and look at each hand and then read about each person. And they're all someone who lives in Missoula. So I was thinking it was a way that um, people could connect and meet other people who live here and have shared or different experiences without having to um, engage with them in person during this time that I think a lot of people felt a lot of isolation and um, we were, really restricted in ways that we could collaborate socially. So it ended up being really impactful for me, I think because um, most of the projects that I had done up until now um, that invited participation, the people who had participated in them mostly were people that I knew beforehand. Um, the Love Is Project had a little bit of people um, that I didn't know from the participation call, but this one ended up being mostly people that I didn't know. Um, so it felt like a really great way for me to feel more involved in the community and learn more about people that are living in this same community that I am, um, that I might not otherwise have been able to meet. Um, and I think it, it felt really special to me also just because um, the project before it happened, it was just an alley with no art in it. And then it had um, these four murals that are still there today um, that I think really help make it feel like a more welcoming place to walk through. Um, and this is just like a photo of what was on my website. So um, people could click on this key and it would pull up a file 
and you can read, um, see all of the digital versions of each hand and read the person's name and a little bit about each of them. Um, so then I, after COVID, I had kind of taken a step back from doing these public involved projects and I ended up um, being able to participate in some that were kind of directed by other community members, but I was involved in them in the art process, which I think was really uplifting. So one that I did just a couple months ago was for Lowell Elementary School. And I was really inspired by this project because um, all of it was just the idea of pretty much two neighbors that live on the north side of town, um, Sam and Gretchen. And they applied for a, a neighborhood improvement grant from the city of Missoula and basically just wanted to have a mural. So went through all the steps of getting funding and then reaching out to artists and um, finding a location that we could put the mural. And I thought it was really inspiring to see like just that it was really accessible for whoever wanted to implement public art could have the resources in Missoula to bring public art to their own neighborhood. Um, so the space that they ended up choosing was Lowell Elementary School. Um, this is a picture of the location that they ended up wanting to work with. Um, it was kind of these interesting cubby holes in the brick wall. Um, so we ended up measure, starting out by measuring them. Um, and then a local carpenter built these big wooden panels. Um, and I sketched out an idea for the mural um, just on my iPad there. But this project is a little bit different because um, so far in community participation projects, I had tried to use my own art to amplify other people's perspectives. But in this one, um, we were actually going to have the community members paint the art themselves. Um, so it was a really interesting learning experience. Um, I hadn't ever used this platform before but it was called volunteer sign up and we basically just had different shifts for painting the mural and sent it all around um the internet and let people whoever wanted to participate in painting sign up for shifts um which it ended up being a good mix of people that i had met before and new people and they came together and these we painted first the backs of the panels so that they would be um not get any water damage. And then we, we propped them up and started getting ready to paint the fronts of them. So it was really interesting for me, um, just kind of sitting back and watching this vision that I had for a mural come to life with just the support of a bunch of community members who are all really excited to um, have a chance trying at painting a mural, which I think was really fun and uplifting. And made me feel super supported. And um, everyone that I talked to who participated said that they had a fun time getting to paint the mural. Um, so then we used a projector and everyone um, traced out the idea that I had and, and painted it on there themselves. Um, and then I went in at the end and painted the little fur details because people thought, geez, that's a lot of little details but I like doing those so I went and put that on and felt included in the process as well that way and here's a photo of the end result um which it's up there now which I think is really exciting to me um partially um I think also just having it in a school is really exciting for me because there's a lot of young people who can then see community made art and feel excited about the future and feel like it's a welcoming space where art is encouraged. Um, and then under this same grant, um, other community members were able to create another mural too on the north side, which was this um, quick build traffic circle. And they gathered us all for um, a celebration at the end and everyone came and we had really wonderful food and celebrated indigenous art and um, walked around and looked at the murals. And we tried to have um, the like another opportunity for interaction at the celebration. So we put up these big pieces of paper with questions on them about public art. Um, some of them were, how does public art build community? And where else should we put public art? Um, and then there were sticky notes so that people who came could stick their own ideas up on there and start brainstorming for future ways that we can incorporate even more public art into Missoula. Um, 
And then we went out and looked at the mural that I helped with the art and then walked over and did the other community members mural and looked at that and it was really inspiring and a wonderful experience to me, I thought. Um, and then the final one that I wanted to talk about a little bit is at the Missoula Public Library. And um, this one I thought was a really, really wonderful project because it incorporated so many perspectives. Um, there was a lot of research going into it and they used the perspectives of children and tribal elders and community members and all of these wonderful people in Missoula. Um, and we tried to amplify all of their perspectives through this one piece of art, um, which I didn't end up putting more information on this because it hasn't been unveiled yet, but I wanted to share that it's going to be at the public library and we'll have an opening for it later, which I'll send out in an email um, to share more about that project, but I kind of wanted to just share a little bit about it um, here um, because this is the final painting and it's up at the library now, but there's going to be a bunch more of a big installation that incorporates a lot of different artists and um, the ideas of so many people in our community. Um, and yeah, I guess that's kind of everything that I wanted to share. Um, yeah, thank you for listening. Thank you, Sala. That was wonderful. Um, I just want to give a quick sort of recap of um, of the the presentation, and then uh, have a, a couple of questions for you, and and open it up to audience questions. Um, please, just a reminder: if you have a question. Um, in the chat, you can, can place it there and we'll read them out. If we do end up with an overflow of questions, which I always hope we do, um, then uh, we will have that opportunity again in February to revisit um, some of the elements of Stella's presentation as well as some of the other discussions that we've had over the course of the 2022 series. Um, so, Stella, uh, you started, you know, talking us through really your process for approaching public works of art, and it sounds to me like um, you you had uh, a moment early on where you were just sort of figuring it out and utilizing your group, your circle, um, to to get into that participatory approach. Um, and the themes that I've heard over and over and over again um, throughout each one of these works is the sense of inclusion and accessibility and how important those elements are to you as an artist and, you know, and really to uh, gr the greater sense of greater community overall in, in bringing art into this world. Um, you know, the the hobgoblin blue. Um, I loved that you had thought through these various elements and then sort of at the kind of last minute made a decision to include something as simple as those pieces of paper right on the table and and this um, new solicitation of participation right there in the moment that people were enjoying the installation that was already up. And I'm hoping that, you know, we can learn a little bit more about how then that went on to inform uh, some of your later works in this regard. Um, and then you know, I just really want to revisit how beautiful it was um, in, uh, and I'm going to fast forward to the mural of feeling welcome uh, that, you know, the, the Zach had put out this call uh, for, in that you had built upon some of those um, intermittent pieces, the love is, the steel wool, and I kind of gone back and forth on how much you elicited um, participation outside of your close circle, uh, you know, and, and brought in those elements. And it sounded like, again, um, for Love Is, 
it was a, a sort of later decision to include those um, pieces of paper and make those pins available for folks to continue to add. Um, but I, but I'm loving the idea that uh, the the uh, elevating the community perspectives during a time of COVID. Did that maybe give you the catalyst or the idea to create reference access for the participants? Because that was a new element in that work. So I think those are kind of my my two my recap. My two first questions are: um, you know, how did that dynamic of that introduction of soliciting additional participation inform later works? And then. Um, how did that, that reference access come about? And is that something that you are, has now got you thinking differently for future work? Yeah, I think that um, I did feel really excited in the beginning about the possibility of trying to uplift as many voices as I could. Um, and I think I was a bit intimidated at first to reach out to the whole world. Um, so it, it was, it helped me um, to start out on a smaller scale, just reaching out to people that I had some contact with. And I think that building off of um, seeing support from those people that I already knew a little bit um, really made me feel empowered to try to expand and connect with the wider community. So um, yeah, I think that it was really foundational and just kind of having a practice run almost, like being able to take um, other people's experiences and try to bring them into an installation. Um, it felt a little bit less scary trying to start out with people that I knew a little bit and then um, feeling like I could use the tools I learned from doing that um, on a smaller scale and then bring it to something a lot larger like the Feeling Welcome project. Um, and I think that for me, the the reference um, point for having like the digital archive of the stories and then having it um, accessible online for people to look back at while they were viewing the mural felt um, particularly driven by the isolation of COVID. So I thought that, um, I think I'm not totally sure what I would have done if, if we would have been able to have a installation that had um, like direct communication with like the viewer and the participants, but I wanted to try to come up with a way that people could have access to the information and kind of community connection of each person um, without needing to see them in real life. And I thought um, that it was a good way for people to be able to reach out to one another through COVID, but also just um, if they have like social anxiety, you could still read about other people without having to go to like an art opening and um, maybe feel less alone in the community by seeing different people's experiences that way. <laughs> awesome, thank you. You know, um, I, I have seen the the participation, in, um, you know, kind of the slips of paper add to this, um, give us your thoughts or your sketch or whatever in response to an exhibition. I've seen that play out in museum spaces. Um, uh, and, and it's really, was fascinating to me that uh, I, I was serving as a docent at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, and there was a particular exhibition that had in the middle of it a space where folks could react to something, a, a video installation actually that they had just seen and and just sort of, it was a very deeply emotional. So they, it was a space for them to like let some of that out before they moved on to the second half of the exhibition. And when I was guiding tours and I observed this of other guided tours, we offered a space like time for individuals to do that, to write and respond and pin it up and almost never would they do it. But the individuals who are going through on their own, at their own pace and their own time and saw this and they, they almost always did pick up the piece of paper and respond. And so I love that in this public installation, you know, these public spaces, it really is a different dynamic. It's kind of like 
the eyes are off. You don't feel inhibited by that. And that second solicitation of participation is so really raw and available. Um, it's more accessible in that way, I think. So I, I love it. I think that's great. Um, I do want to uh, bring forward a question from the chat. Um, uh, let's see here. Molly says, I don't consider myself an artist, but I do love participating in community-based art projects. I'm not always sure where to look for opportunities though. How do you reach out to community members and where should I look for chances to participate? In addition to Molly's question, you have just an outpouring of love. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I think I would like to expand the ways that I've tried to like facilitate these participation opportunities for community members. But initially, one way that I had tried to reach out to people was just through putting posters around town. So I like dropped them off at a bunch of local businesses and people would put them up in the windows. Um, or sometimes there's telephone poles around that have a bunch of posters and like show gigs stapled to them. So I'd staple those uh signs to those um so i guess just keeping an eye out for maybe little pieces of paper that are sometimes easy to overlook but it can sometimes have events um available that way um i've also seen now that social media is a bit more active there's some um facebook groups like visual arts in missoula i know that a lot of the time they will share um like links to pages of events that are going to happen which allow for public participation. So trying to um, look on Facebook for these groups that they usually have Missoula in the name, but like Arts Missoula is one of them. Um, and then there's also a lot of really great community arts organizations here in town, like um, the Public Art Committee is one of them, and then Open Air and um, like the Missoula Art Museum are some, and Radius Gallery. These are all different places that I go to to look for arts um, involvement and they often do a good job of sharing about events when they're going to be coming up as well. Um, and then I think the Missoulian also does a pretty good job of like trying to keep updated about up upcoming events and when things are happening, they'll have the arts and entertainment section and then they often will um, publish whenever something's going to be happening and how you can get information about it there. Um, and I think also just if you have existing community member um, art that you are interested in, like following it on Instagram, um, I've seen that's kind of a silly way, but a good easy way for people to share information is like people will oftentimes like post up in their stories or on posts um, if they hear about an event going on um, somewhere in the local arts community. And um, in my experience, everyone's been super supportive here. And so if someone has an idea, then it gets shared around quite a, a fair bit on social media that way. Thank you, Stella. So there is um, a question here from Stoney, and I, I, I want to read her question, but I also want to point out in case there's those of you who are not aware that the piece of work behind Stoney right now is actually one of Stella's. And after Stella has an opportunity to answer Stoney's question, I have a question that kind of ties back into to not necessarily that piece in particular, but my thoughts around on that. Um, Stoney wants to know, how does your experience inform your ideas for future community engaged projects? Yeah, I think that like from doing all of these projects, I learned like little tiny bits that I thought I would like to do differently. There were things in all of them that I really liked and things that I thought didn't work super well. So I've kind of just been taking like an inventory of my mind of how to keep making each project hopefully more successful um, as I try to come up with new ideas. And I think that a lot of that has been just learning and experiencing and seeing um, like participant feedback. And I'll usually try and add ask people like not put them on a spot or anything but just conversationally like how they felt about the experience that they participated in and if they wanted me to do anything different going forward or if there were ways that they could have felt more included or had more of a um like accessibility to the project so I think it's definitely informed my ideas for how I want to do 
future projects just from like learning what worked and what didn't work. Um, and also just I've learned so much from the people who have come and participated in these projects and like the insights that they had because I think everyone approaches art a little bit differently. So even just it was really eye opening on this last project watching how other people approached like taking my art and drawing it as a mural. Um, it was a lot different than like how I would have started drawing the mural and it was really insightful to see different techniques that people used. Um, and I think that I've always been kind of nervous about like how to really give an opportunity for people to make their own art and um, try to not like try to make it accessible but without telling people what to do. So I think it's been um, yeah, it was really helpful just trying these different ways of engaging with the community and also just seeing how different artists have gone about doing similar projects, um, which I think I wasn't, um, I, I wasn't like totally prepared on how to speak about the public library installation, but I definitely think that um, it's something to keep an eye out for when um, that is more ready for the world, um, because that has been a really inspiring project for me to be part of um, just like so much support and community interaction and I'm getting nervous and kind of blanked out and started saying a bunch of stuff but um yes <laughs> not at all um one of the things that I, I I thought was so lovely about the uh the school in the the school project um was that celebration that community celebration at the end and utilizing that as a of course, beautifully ready-made opportunity to solicit the um, participants and the greater community's ideas about public art and moving forward and all of that. Um, just what a brilliant way to, to get those insights, you know, as part of that celebratory moment. Um, my question uh, regarding your work, uh, um, the, the, the information of your public arts work going forward is how does it, how does your public arts work inform your personal, like this is exclusive to you, Stella, as an artist work going forward. I know, um, you know, from listening to you talk in, in at previous events, um, you sort of have two types of work that that you, you delve into and I, I guess maybe even three now that I'm thinking about the community space being in on a different um, platform then um, you have this very deeply personal work that you do that's uh, a little more abstract a little more tactile in some ways um, representative of the piece that is Stoney's background right now and then you have um, more um, of a stylized approach to some of your other works. And I would love to hear how the public artworks inform those other, those other sides of Stella Dahl's work. Yeah, that's a great question. I don't, I feel like I haven't totally thought about it explicitly before. Um, like in my mind, I kind of like compartmentalize it into like, yeah, I guess kind of like these three separate bodies of work, but I know that they definitely must inform one another. Um, and I think just like the first thing that comes to mind is just, um, it's been very helpful to me to do these public projects because um, they've ended up, like I guess just selfishly, they've made me feel really supported and like part of the community, um, which I think that my intention in building them was to like try to make other people feel included but it also ended up making me feel like really included and um I think that just taking momentum from those like the feelings of like being welcome in the community has helped me want to like keep making my own work and um if I have ideas for something that I'm like I often have a lot of like self-doubt when I'm working on my own studio work so just having like feedback and positive interaction with people about my art has been really helpful in like giving me I guess like like inspire I almost said inspirement but um encouragement inspirement for making more projects and sharing them with people I love inspirement I think we all need more of it in our lives <laughs> 
So there's a, there are, I, I believe, a couple more questions here, Stella, that I would like to get to. I also just want to read a couple of the comments um, that folks have been weighing in on to, to lift them up to, to everyone in case folks aren't following the chat. Uh, going through school for studio art, there are many opportunities or prompts to be critical to pinpoint and talk about what isn't working in society. Your work to amplify and support the community is wonderful. Was there a moment where you made a conscious decision for nourishing rather than critical work? Yeah, um, I think that's a really good point, which I've done actually quite a bit of thinking about that because in a lot of my studio work and more private work, I do a lot of analyzing of, I guess, issues of society that I find really problematic. So doing this public work, I was thinking about what I wanted to reflect back to the community and I like what I wanted people to see on a daily basis, especially like kids. Um, I think that like public art can have such a really big impact on kind of providing the narrative that forms the world that we live in. Um, so I had a really interesting kind of conflicting experience in one of the murals that I was painting. Um, I guess I'm this is kind of an all backwards story, but um, a couple of years ago for the transfer station, um, the bus station, I was like trying to come up with imagery to celebrate um, indigenous identity in Missoula. Um, and a lot of what kept coming up when I was trying to think about what I wanted to do was like um, most of the public art that I've seen come out of the indigenous voices that I really look up to in the last couple of years has been heavily focused on the missing and murdered indigenous peoples crisis, which is really important. And I think that work definitely needs a lot um, to be amplified. And um, but one thing that I was thinking about is it can be kind of discouraging when like the only representation that you see about your community community is something that's like really painful. And I think that like growing up um, and learning indigenous history and stuff, a lot of the time, the stuff that I was taught would be kind of painful um, or like sad history, which there is, it is so important to learn that, but I wanted to create a space that would celebrate a lot of like the resilience and like really kind of give um, a big celebration of the joy that exists too, because I think it's, it feels a lot like as an artist, it has felt really pressing for me to focus on like the more serious, painful parts of society and history um, because they are important and have a lot of weight, but it also has resulted in me like not focusing on joy. And I think that that is something that's so important. So I wanted to um, create a mural that really celebrated the joyful part of indigenous identity. I don't know if I explained that super well. I kind of thought in a circle. But, I really um, don't think you could have explained it <laughs> any better. Um, Stella, you bring a tremendous amount of joy to all of us um, in all of your forms of work. Um, so uh, DG would like to know what sparked your adventure to become an artist? Ooh, I bet it was so many things. Um, I think a big part of it is just both of my parents are really creative people and my older brother is too. Um, so kind of everything about my childhood was really encouraging for like creativity and like reusing materials. And my mom is a, um, like a really wonderful bead worker. And I think that seeing her work growing up was like really exciting to me and made me want to be making stuff myself. Um, so I've always kind of been drawn to art and um, I guess just like, seeing other people's art that I really liked. And um, it's also always been kind of a self-soothing thing since I have quite a bit of like um, mental illness issues. I think that art has always been something I've gravitated to as a way of like grounding myself and processing my emotions and also just trying to find joy. Um, like a lot of the little weird little creatures that I draw, I've drawn since I was like a small child and it's just kind of like creating an imaginary friend of sorts. Um, and just like drawing something to make me smile and hopefully make other people smile. Um, yeah. Wonderful. 
So we have one more question here that I, I think probably will be our closing question looking at the time. Um, but I also just wanted to uh, point to the chat for those of you who are interested in uh, the, these types of events happening near you. Ethan suggests taking a look at uh, websites for adjacent communities and has given some suggestions in that, that space as well. Um, Paul said, public art is a social experiment, wh which your work is. In addition, it's an expression of what we imagine the world, our world, our community can be in a radically different way. Do you experience that in your work? Hmm. Yeah, I guess I would say just the short answer is yes. Um, because I think a lot about the phrase, I forget who said it, but just that art imitates life and life imitates art. Um, so I think that art can be just a reflection of the reality of our world, but it can also be equally powerful if it's used as a tool for reimagining what the world could be. And I think just trying to find joy in that reimagining is something that's really important to me to kind of give hope and like momentum for going forward. Um, yeah, and I feel like it is a really great tool for just imagining things and since when you have paint, you don't have to draw the world exactly as it is. It's a good way to make uh, like a cow have little hands. <laughs> what a perfect place <laughs> <laughs> to close on. <laughs> um, I just want to. Oh. Um, Jenny says that she's feeling incredibly inspired right now and uh, and gives her thanks. It's a lot of outpouring of thanks and love uh, going on here today. Um, I just want to add to that thanks. Thank you, Stella, so much uh, for, for making this time to talk with us, share with us your process and um, and your beautiful work. And thanks to everyone who joined us today. Um, I'm actually gonna kick it over to Stoney uh, to talk about um, next dates and, uh, and how you can uh, join, continue to join us for this series. Um, I, just don't, I don't have that next date read at the ready on my okay. screen, so. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Amy. So uh, thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, so as I mentioned, we'll, we'll we're, we're experimenting here. So our next session is going to be um, in a month. In February, we do the second Thursday of every month at noon on Zoom. Um, all of you registered. So we have your emails and we'll, I'll just follow up with you with a link to this recording as well as um, a link to join us if you'd like to join for discussion. We might work together with Stella to kind of create some prompts of questions she has that emerged out of this um, and encourage you to bring some questions and we'll use that to get started and just enjoy getting into conversation together in a more organic way. It won't be recorded, it won't be posted, it'll be a, a private space for us to have dialogue. Um, also, I just want to plug, we, we're starting a workshop series, um, and it, it's going to kick off with Tracy Hall at the end of this month um, with zine making at the library. Um, they're free. We encourage donations for people who are able to, but they're uh, meant to be accessible opportunities to both connect with creativity and place in our community. Um, and Stella is going to be doing one in May at Traveler's Rest. So at some point in time, we'll have sign up available for it, um, and we'll make sure you get a link to that if you're interested. Um, so February 9th at noon will be our kind of discussion series. And we're lining up speakers right now for the rest of this. So we'll we'll have kind of our, our um, calendar of events that we'll send out to you. If you know of anybody or you yourself are Indigenous creative who might be interested in sharing um, about the work that you're, what inspires you, what gets you excited, uh, reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you um, and, and include you, so. That's all I have. Stella, thanks for sharing uh, all the things with us. Yeah. <laughs> okay, take care guys, have a great day.